Hey guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the show where we get the folks who are transforming the way we think about the future. Today, we got one of them focused on a couple of different avenues, Peter Bose. Thanks for coming today, Peter. It's my pleasure. Good to talk to you. So live long and master aging. What's the what's your story? How did you get interested or obsessed? I'm not sure which it is <laughs> in, in longevity and biohacking. Yeah, I think I prefer interested rather than obsessed, but it does become an obsession after a while. I've been interested in this for quite a long time, really. I suppose I got really interested when I made um, a couple of documentaries for the BBC, and I was looking at different aspects of not necessarily super longevity, but those things that we can do to extend or maintain our health span, as live you know, as long as we can with optimum health. And so I was looking at all the obvious things like diet and, and exercise. And I met Dr. Volta Longo at uh, USC, University of Southern California. And at that stage, a good few years ago, he was um, just beginning his first human trial with his fasting mimicking diet. And we covered that in the documentary. And he asked whether I wanted to take part in that clinical trial as one of the subjects, which uh, sounded quite an interesting idea. So I did that. And that's what probably really hooked me in into looking at some of the science as to what we can do to maybe, as I say, not extend our lives that significantly. Maybe we can get to 100, 120. Uh, maybe we get to 90, but we are agile and we are mentally alert and we're still living a full life at 90. That would be good enough for me. And uh, I think certainly that, that diet, there are many other diets uh, uh, that related to fasting that are, uh, are good, but certainly that one hooked me in because of its, uh, its relative simplicity. And uh, as well as that, uh, I've covered documentaries uh, doing um, interviews with people in Loma Linda, the longest lived community in, in the United States, uh, just outside of Los Angeles, where they um, are mostly Seventh-day Adventists and live a, a lifestyle that just seems to promote longevity. And they, they tend to live up to maybe seven or eight, even 10 years longer than, than most Americans. So it's a, a variety of factors that uh, sort of hooked me into this. And um, I'm, I'm still fascinated by it, if not obsessed. Yeah, I think it's, uh, if you're not at least a little bit obsessed with the things you're interested in, then you're not very interested in the things you're obsessed with. Right. You really, I, I, I know I dive into things. So I know fasting, fasting has been something that's finally starting to get a little bit more coverage publicity. We've talked about it a little bit here on the podcast, the, the benefits of cellular autophagy and some other reasons. But can you kind of dive into what you learned from those documentaries and what you've learned since? Yeah, well, as far as fasting is concerned, now you mentioned autophagy, which is one of the, the key components, I think, of, of fasting. That's essentially cells eating themselves, uh, your body getting rid of those cells that are perhaps uh, past their sell-by date, they're not working as well as they should, and your, your body is, is kind of regrowing. So after a period of, of fasting, you are, you're growing new white blood cells, for example, you might be growing new muscle cells, and uh, you're basically rebuilding yourself. But that's a, a forced rebuild over quite a relatively short period of, of time. And I think that's been shown to be to beneficial. Uh, also in terms of uh, fasting over a longer period of time, and um, this is one of the subjects that uh, Walter Longo has been looking into and I've covered in a, a documentary, and that is the, the role of IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor one, a secondary growth hormone, which um, has been shown to, if you, there's too much IGF-1, has been shown to be linked to, to cancer in uh, in the latter in your latter years and uh, if you can keep that level of igf1 down i'm not talking about an excessively low level but if you can keep it down i think there is some evidence that that could uh, help you grow to a, a an older age without getting some of those killer diseases of of old age so that, that, that those are a couple of things that that really interest me and uh, I, I also look at other aspects of, of longevity, I think, as well as, as your diet. I think uh, your sleep regime is important. I, I think your exercise regime, intense exercise especially, is very important. And, uh, and, you, and a big part of this, which I'm really learning from the podcast, is your social connections, how you relate to other people, members of your family, your, your circle of friends. And this is something I really learned in Loma Linda, that Seventh-day Adventists are a very sociable group of people. It's not necessarily anything to do with religion per se, although it is part of the religion, but purely setting by maybe just one day of the week, it's a Saturday in this case, to socialize, to have a quieter time, to be with people, I think really helps your longevity and your ability to, to age well. I, I interviewed a, a woman, she was 102 years old, and she's still going strong, she's 104 now, and she has an incredibly strong 
social circle and, and always has done and she's always got something to look forward to so those are some of the, the key pillars i think that are very important i think a lot of that was interesting and worth dissecting let's play devil's advocate though so i know a lot of us have heard the importance of the the social support the social circle do you think that is directly because of the individuals or do you think that's because being around others especially those you like forces you to be present to live in the moment i.e like meditation yeah, it certainly forces you to be in the moment and to to enjoy the company of others. And I think, I mean, obviously meditation can be a, a solitary exercise. So although the benefits might be similar, I think the, the, the means to the end, they're different. I think in terms of socialization, especially for older people, it is that idea of always having something to, to look forward to, to maintain a, a positive frame of mind. It's been shown many, many studies showing that loneliness in old age can be as big a killer, perhaps as smoking cigarettes or some of the other obvious killers that, that lead to deadly diseases, that uh, isolation, social isolation, loneliness uh, for those in the 70s, 80s and 90s can, can have a devastating effect on your, your lifespan and your health span. So I think uh, that component of being with other people, it could be just a, a family circle of people, but it could be reaching out to making new friends. And that's the other thing I've learned that uh, a lot of older people seem to do well when they surround themselves with uh, younger generations. Now it can be their, their children, their, their grandchildren, or it can be in perhaps an assisted living place where there are lots of younger people as well. I know a lot of universities, um, are actually housing, uh, in association with assisted living places, housing students alongside older people to the benefit of both generations. I think younger people can learn from the wisdom of older people. Older people can benefit from that socialization and the the wisdom of, uh, of a young person's mind. Energy is contagious. I've heard of these programs as well, and I especially like the ones where the colleges are offering classes for senior citizens. Essentially, once you retire, your body is kind of designed to die unless you give it a purpose. You have to have some type of purpose. I think if you're not learning, you're dying. Totally agree. I think purposeful aging is extremely important. And podcast-wise, I've interviewed a number of people who are in the 70s and, and 80s and still doing great things. I interviewed the musician Herb Albert. He's in his early 80s, an extraordinary career, had his own record label. He discovered the Carpenters and of course he's a great solo artist in his own right. He is still writing, he's still traveling, he's still touring and he's still performing. Uh, he's a, an artist, he's a sculptor. He has all these things going on in his life and he's going great guns. I mean he is very vital, he's very agile and always has something to look forward to. And I think that epitomizes purposeful aging. Now you don't have to be a, a superstar, you don't have to be a Hollywood person to live that kind of life. You can be an, an ordinary person and have things to look forward to. It could be just the next season, season in the garden. It could be planting some seeds. It could be having a new puppy and seeing the puppy grow up and go to training classes. Th those kind of ordinary things that move life forward meaning that your brain is, is continues to be active. You don't have, you say, as you say, you don't have that point where you retire and everything stops. And I think, I think what I've learned is that, and what I certainly intend to do and strive to do is that is not live that kind of life where everything in it is devoted towards the job and towards the work. There's got to be other things in there as well that you can perhaps pick up and maybe to the point of frustration that you don't always have time to do these things while you're working, but they're there to look forward to and perhaps to expand on when you, when you get older. Have you heard anyone that has an interesting or solid system for, I think pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone is highly beneficial. And it's something we all instinctively cringe and try to avoid. I think it's something that if you systematized it, it would be healthy, help you live longer and more meaningful lives. Yeah, I think I totally agree. Couldn't agree more. And the, the person, the name that comes to mind is Joe DeSena. Joe uh, founded the Spartan races and he is he is huge on getting out of your comfort zone that every day we should uh, endure a bit of discomfort in his case I mean it can be getting out of bed at five o'clock in the morning and climbing up a, 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 a hillside or a mountainside and uh, and back again before breakfast and a lot of other stuff as well it can be taking a cold shower every day which, which he does 
And he says it never gets any better. A cold shower is a cold shower. It's never much fun. But the fact that you can, I mean, there are, there's obviously cryotherapy benefits, I think, in, in terms of taking cold showers and cold baths. There's, uh, I think, a lot of evidence that if you're a, a, a active person if you're an athlete that actually is is good for you in terms of the repair process and the recovery process from exercise but just the sheer discomfort of it and the endurance for those four or five minutes i think makes you a, a better person and uh, you can apply that principle to other aspects in your life jumping out of your comfort zone doing something that you don't normally do it could be for some people doing what we're doing right now it could be doing an interview it could be going on television, it could be public speaking, jumping out of your comfort zone. There's that obviously that endorphin rush as you do it and as you achieve it, and you realize that you can achieve it. And I think combined, all of those things really help us just move to the next stage and, and, and keep on going. I would highly recommend the cold showers. I do that every day and it sucks every time. But it, it is so beneficial for you, not just in terms of the mental strength, it also turns white fat into brown fat, which is more mitochondrially dense. You have more energy, you feel, I mean, you come out of it kind of screaming like Wolverine and then you're ready to take on the day. It's uh, it's interesting. What yeah, are, I, I, oh. I, I, I agree totally. I, I, I wish I did it every day. I don't do it every day, I'll be honest with you, but I, I, I've done it and do it sporadically. And at the end of every shower, I think that was great. That was great. I've got to do it tomorrow. I've got to do it tomorrow. So, you, you know, there's a weakness there in me that I don't do it every day, but I totally agree with you. It's very beneficial. It has to be a rule for me because then it's non-negotiable and I don't have to think about it again. Mm -hmm. If I have to decide between having the sugary drink or, or uh, drinking alcohol, if I have to decide every time, I'm going to fail a lot of those decisions. It's just the process of elimination. It's, uh, it's interesting the way that people, everyone's got their own system. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's human nature to 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 take the easy route, and the easy route is to switch the hot water on in the shower and enjoy that traditional shower. And, and like many other aspects of of life, the easy route is often to say no to something that you really wish you could do and you really want to do, but you're you're nervous about it. Whatever it is, as I say, whether it's public speaking or whether it's writing your first novel or whatever that task is that you really want to do, it, but there's something at the back of your mind is just stopping you. You kind of just got to go for it and and maybe suffer some from difficult times and some difficult days if you're, you're training for something but the you, you reap the rewards and I, i've interviewed so many people that um, have faced that dilemma in their lives and they get over it and they're they're bigger they're better persons after it what's your 10x goal what is my what sorry your 10x goal thinking bigger my 10x goal, um, thinking bigger. In other words, what is that? What is that hurdle that I need to leap over? Well, I just mentioned writing a book. I've been procrastinating, I think, for, for a long time about writing a book and you know putting all these thoughts uh, onto paper and uh, maybe encapsulating what a lot of the people have told me in the interviews for the podcast. So um, that that is my goal at the moment. Is just and we're announcing it live right here, right? Say again. And we're announcing it right here, right? Coming and soon. Right, yeah, and I've said it a few times. Yeah, and I've got to keep. I've got to keep. You know, got to match up to my um, promises. And uh, yes, we're announcing it here, so it will be coming soon in a bookstore near you or uh, online. <laughs> uh, yes, give me a give me a couple of years. A couple of years. Okay, I'm going to need a date. I find <laughs> dates are very helpful for goals. Yeah, you're going to need a date. Okay, so we're uh, approaching 2019. Let's go for uh, 2021. 2021. Okay, we'll hold you to that. Okay. So, or sooner, <laughs> or sooner. Sooner is always better. So, um, speaking of sooner is always better. A lot of people live life like a race, and they try to get there first. Um, how do we do a better job of that as a society? I, I feel like we are in a rat race a little bit, and yet the people that enjoy life and live longer are typically the ones that somehow opt out of that. Yeah, I think there's a happy medium there. I think there's a rat race for, for, for a lot of us. I think there's um, an overwhelm factor that a lot of us are feeling at the moment. I, I certainly feel it. We all multitask. We all do different jobs. The podcast for me is only just part, a small part of, of what I do uh, in terms of the my allocation of time in a week. I've got other jobs and responsibilities. Um, and uh, those other jobs involve covering news for me, which is very unpredictable, which makes planning other aspects of my life equally difficult so it's a, a big juggling act and it can it can cause this sense of overwhelm at times and so i'm very big on setting aside i just like to call it white space if it's white space in the calendar if there's not nothing written in there it's it's space that i can play with it's time that i can play with during the week and it it might just help fill the gap 
it might just help move things around or it might one, be one, a, one sec peter it, it stopped for a sec sorry i okay. i got i'm just and then for some reason it froze and i don't think okay. that part came through okay can you can you just start a little bit before that and we'll cut it yeah sure, sure. um so there's this sense there's this sense of overwhelm i think that descends on a lot of people that we're all multitasking we're all trying to do so many different things and one way i try to deal with that is uh, i just call it having more white space it can be white space in the digital calendar that uh, is there perhaps just to move around and uh, help accommodate uh, other things that overflow during the week or you approach that white space let's say it's a thursday afternoon and there's nothing scheduled use it in a in a positive sense and it that doesn't necessarily mean just doing more work it can actually mean going for a hike with a dog it could mean doing an extra session at the gym or, or whatever you really want to to do that helps your blood pressure just just fall a little bit and it just uh, i think brings you back to a, a semblance of of normality that uh, most of us don't really experience that much these days because we're all rushing from one thing to the next and as i say this sense of over overwhelm descends on us so i think um it's the times that we're living in we're in difficult times we're living in conflicted times uh, certainly in the united states and there's a lot of angst around i think uh, i don't want to get into politics but uh, some people see these as, as quite difficult times others don't of course but um i think we need each individually to take some responsibility um for ourselves and just to make that time and just to ease the pressure a little bit on our minds because no one else is going to do it for you. No one else is going to do it. No one else really cares. In fact, what everyone else wants to do is push more things on you because they want you to do them um, or they want to see the results of something that's going to benefit them. And yeah, I can't criticize people for that because we essentially all do it. We kick that tin can down the road in, in many respects. So yeah, you're right. You've got to take responsibility for yourself, even if it means saying no. And I think one of the great lessons we can all learn is just that simple one of, of how to say no to something you might quite like to do, but you know that ultimately it's going to overwhelm you. What are two or three things that you're doing right now that people might not, people listening might find strange or controversial, but that you think are helpful? Well, I don't know whether strange or controversial, but I actually just a few minutes ago mentioned uh, puppy and training. I got a puppy about six months ago, three months ago. She was three Ooh. months then. And um, I go to a puppy training class twice a week, and it takes an hour, and it takes uh, 15 minutes to get there. And it takes a significant chunk out of two days a week, plus the daily regimes of just training a puppy at home and dealing with the puppy and going along hikes. And she's a border collie, so she's mega, mega active and uh, super intelligent and very demanding. Ask me nine months ago if I had space in my life to do that, and I said no no way but then something forced me into doing it and i did do it and it doesn't help me in any other aspect of my life in terms of career podcasting broadcasting journalism but it helps me a lot because i really enjoy it and i i see the animal growing and getting results together and uh, that, that it, it falls into that zen category that uh, that hour of the day or a couple of days of training and then a daily regime is one that I really enjoy. And um, you know, it serves no other purpose than just me and the animal. And uh, I think there's a lot of evidence that people, older people actually with, with animals, uh, if they want to treat themselves to a, a puppy or a kitten or whatever they can do with, it, it certainly helps them in their lives. And, and I, I can easily see why. Yeah, I would, I would definitely agree with that. And I've found that if you find people that don't like animals, especially dogs, but ones that don't like animals, generally speaking, are not good human beings. Ones that love animals are generally speaking, because it's hard not to love innocence. I totally agree. It's hard not to love innocence and that, uh, you know, that sense of love that you get from an animal that uh, is actually quite difficult to replicate in a human being because there are no strings attached when you see those eyes looking up at you and uh, you know, eager to go for a walk or to do a training session or to be fed or wh whatever it is. It is a unique relationship. And if only, perhaps if only some human beings could be like that and learn a few lessons from the way that animals, um, a a anything that an animal does wrong with a human being is generally the human being's fault because of that relationship has fallen down. The, the, the animals have that ability just to see the world in a, a simpler way that I, I think we could all learn a lot from if we could if we could replicate that. Just to clarify, we're not talking about house cats. They want you to feed them. They don't really love you, and if you die, they will eat you. But <laughs> dogs, especially, I can I can agree on that. Yeah, so, yeah. 
So in your in your work with the BBC and in your work as a reporter, actually better question, how do we fix the media and news industry? I think it's broken. It's it's having a lot of problems at the moment and it's changing. I don't know whether it's broken or it is changing and it can't keep up with itself. Now, it's changing in the respect that we're all consuming news in different ways. Look back 10 years ago and we consumed news, maybe longer than that, we consumed news from a, a newspaper and a television at fixed points in the day. Now news is bombarding us 24-7 with notifications, with social media, with, and I hate this expression, but with fake news there to stumble over and have to figure out what is genuine news and what is properly researched news, what is impartial news. There are all these factors being thrown at us that um, are not all entirely the news industry's fault. I think there are other external factors in there creating problems for us. But um, we, we've got a lot to navigate at the moment. And I think as a business, you've got to realize that the technology is changing and there's not going to be a reversal there. So we're not going to go back to the old ways of consuming news. So we have to editorially be as impartial, as as tough as possible to get fair news that is fair to, if it's a political argument, to, to both sides. I'm not one of those news reporters working for an, for an organization that has a point of view. I've got a personal point of view, but I really don't want to express that publicly in the news outlets that I'm working for. Yes, that's fine for, for some, as long as it's very clear up front where the uh, political slant is. But I think um, yeah, there's a lot of work to be done on just producing impartial news. And then a lot of work on delivering the news in a format that people find easy to consume without dumbing it down too much, without having too many three second sound bites that masquerade as a, as a full story because you just can't do that. I think I think that's part of the problem, but I don't think it addresses the larger issue. I think the issue of news is that it's inherently the incentive structures are built incorrectly. So if you look at news and we had a hundred year newspaper, we would look at it and 95% of the pages would be filled with incredible things. We've cured this. We've cured that. Uh, the war is over. Um, Humanity is living longer. All of these incredible things, the internet sliced bread, but when you look, there's that small percentage that's incredibly negative, World War I, World War II. But when you try to take this concept of the news and invert it so that it becomes real time or close to real time, in everyday life, there's not that many incredible things that are happening. There's a lot of okay things, there's some shitty things, and there's enough not nice things that that's what sells because humanity's designed to look for potential, we've evolved to look for threats. So threats are typically violence or something related to sex in terms of someone stealing your man or woman. And that's that's more or less what we're evolutionarily driven to focus on. If we have a system where you have to fill content continuously, you, you can't sell good content, you can't sell happiness, you have to sell sadness. Yeah, well, there's this old saying that if it bleeds, it leads. If it is devastating, if it is dramatic, if it is horrific, it leads the bulletin. And that's always been the case. And and there is a, a certain human nature that people gravitate towards that kind of coverage, uh, whether it's a, a human disaster, a natural disaster, a man-made disaster, uh, with uh, certainly in television terms, with good pictures. Um, and you're right, you don't have that kind of thing every day, and, and nor should we. And thank goodness we don't have disaster and doom and gloom every day. Um, I think one, I think what you're getting at is that we have so much, we have infinite time now to produce and disseminate news in all the different platforms that we're cramming everything in there, and that nothing really, and not a lot of it falls into that traditional definition of what news is. And um, that's to, to some extent where, where fake news comes in, where you know stupid news comes in, where you know skateboarding dogs come in. We're trying to cram the old-fashioned airwaves or you know, digital media with these different stories just to fill time and grab people's attention. I think perhaps we need to to focus in on what really is news and deliver that in the professional as professional way as possible. But I'm not that naive that all the other stuff is going to go away. Maybe we just don't call it news. 
I think it's a similar problem to the stock market that it's constantly trading so that there's no loyalty towards a better future. It's only about that it's incentivized on the immediate short term. Do you think it would be possible to have a newspaper that only went out once a week, once a month? It would be much more positive and uplifting. Well, I suppose we do. We have weekly news magazines that are published once a week, and they round up the, the week's news. Obviously, the big stories are on the, the front page still. And, um, you know, you get feature items and, and lighter items as well. It, it's, it's eminently possible to do that. But I think it depends on the editorial focus of what that publication is, whether there is a huge demand these days for, for a publication that comes out Weekly, uh, I'm I'm not so sure because there's this sense of instant gratification that you get from from digital news, from from mobile news that uh, I think, um, yes, especially young people, don't really get what it's like anymore to to wait for something that's a little bit more considered, a, a longer form article or a, or a long read. I know it's a, a, there are actually a number of organisations that are trying to do that now and and have been for for. for quite a while that are trying to buck the trend and put more resources into to slow news as some people call it and that is well resourced well researched articles that um, I think we probably need more of I think to to counterbalance the the, the sound bites and the and the the bites of stories that don't really tell you the full story so uh, I mean, I mean I'm all, all for it uh, these longer form news outlets whether they can survive in the current economic climate and whether they can bring in the advertising they need to keep going i i don't really know what do you think about billionaires like bezos and benioff buying their own news outlets well you know it's a, a double-edged sword i mean obviously if you've got billionaires owning news outlets it's good to have money going into news outlets and it, it all depends on the i suppose the editorial freedom that the outlet ends up having and and if it can still continue unfettered with uh, an independent editorial board, let's say it's a newspaper or, or magazine, I think that's that's all to the good. I think we, we can't be so naive in this world that um, billionaires, millionaires are not going to want to get into the, the news world. I think it's how they uh, operate within that space. And uh, I don't necessarily see it as, as a bad thing. I think what what is bad is when people get into the news business and think that they can use their wealth to direct a, an outlet in a particular editorial direction. Like now, 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 there might be an audience for that. And I think, again, if it's, everyone's upfront about it, OK. It's not the news that I particularly want to devour. Do you think we should make news a mandatory nonprofit? I don't know if that's realistic. Um, I don't. I mean, obviously, an organization like the BBC in the UK, where it's paid for by a, a license fee, is a, essentially a, a nonprofit um, or, or, and they're some of the best in the world, hands down. Yes, and and thank you. And uh, everyone says that. And and long may it continue. Long may it be an independent broadcaster. It's essentially paid for, at least in the UK. There is a commercial element to the BBC outside of the UK, but at least in the UK, it is essentially paid for by it's a, it's, a, it's called a television license. It's a it's a tax that uh, pays for the output and. Um, and hopefully, therefore, maintains that uh, independence that the BBC has long had, and I, I think is wonderful. But you don't see that repeated um, to a great extent in, in other countries. And, and, uh, and the, the model has never been there. And therefore, I don't know that it's realistic that news in the United States, for example, can suddenly become a, a non-profit outfit. I think, um, you know, I think, and I don't necessarily think that those outfits, you know, the traditional providers, um, are all bad. I think there's some great journalists working for for-profit organizations, television, newspapers in, in this country that produce some very good journalism. What do you think about the surge of one, two man, the, the small shows, podcasts, blogs, et cetera, that have built up incredible followings? More people watch Joe Rogan than probably watch uh, CBS. Yeah, the Tim Ferrisses of this world. Um, I um, I listen to them. I, I watch them if they do video. I think they, they do some really, really good stuff. And um, I think what's what's interesting, let's say just the podcasting world, is that the, there are these these big hitters, these big audience you know, and big money um, people that uh, are pulling in huge audience and they're getting some, some great guests. And I, I actually say more power to them because I, I think um, uh, a lot of the stuff that they produce is, is very interesting. I think that the real challenge for the one-man bands are those people who don't have... Um, 
you know, the, the money and the infrastructure behind them to to produce a, a podcast on, at the same level. So it's incredibly competitive. But um, I think um, we need role models in this world. And I think if people can make a success of, of podcasting, especially um, video podcasts, uh, especially, which is exactly something I haven't got into. I've tried to focus purely on audio. But um, I um, I think we all have you know goals to strive for. And a lot of these people do, do really good, interesting uh, programs or podcasts. And uh, I, I see nothing wrong with that. I'm a big fan of the Sam Harris model, the the crowdfunded. Well, it's not entirely fair to say he started from nothing because he had the books and he had the audience. But being able to have fans crowdfund via Patreon or other means, the the content that's being created. Yeah, I, I think Patreon's really good. I think uh, it's a, an excellent model. And I think clearly for people that have uh, loyal audiences and have a unique message that that audience appreciates and wants to help continue, I think that is absolutely a wonderful uh, platform. Now, whether it is going to grow to the point that it can sustain enough people that, that want to use it, I don't know. I think it's going to become a, a tipping point. There's only so much money out there. There are only so many patrons, I think, that can support that kind of podcast. But um, as it is right now, I think it's it's really good. And I think it's something to strive for. And it's a two-way venture. That you, you, you give something and, and you and you get something back in, in terms of funding. And I think that's uh, hugely inspiring to a lot of people who are starting out this new. And you don't have to listen to us read four minutes of ads about this nice Casper mattress that I like to lay on and get to rent for a year. Well, yeah, and that is, a, I don't know about you, but that is a great frustration of mine that many podcasts these days do start with the four, five, even 10 minute intros that, that go on forever and involve a lot of necessary mentions of sponsors or advertising or whatever it is. That, um, you know, I think they are going to wear on the patience of, of some of the listeners to those podcasts after a while. And, uh, and thank goodness for the 15 second fast forward, which I, I admit I use quite a lot to, to get through that. And I, I see it as a, it's a necessary evil for some people. Again, it's the, not something that I've personally gone down. Um, actually, I'm not getting any funding in for my podcast at the moment. And that's that's been deliberate so far. It won't always be like that, but it's been deliberate so far for the first I'm looking maybe for the first 100 episodes, first couple of years, that I wanted really to focus on editorial and to get the right feel to the podcast, to get some pretty decent guests. But uh, you know, reality dawns after a while, and it, it won't always be, be free in that sense. Yeah, it's got to make money. And you're, you're either giving up your time and attention and credibility, or you're, get, you're helping fund it. If you guys want to help fund this, disruptors.fm slash Patreon. We try yeah. to avoid it. Exactly. I think that that's the interesting dilemma, isn't it? It's it's credibility versus reality. And as I say, reality dawns and you know, you, you don't get anything for nothing these days and you, you can't keep working for nothing. Uh, equally, if you have no sponsorship attached, no commercial uh, ventures attached, well, clearly your credibility, perhaps with the audience, goes up because you, you have that appearance of not trying to sell anything, which is which is good. But equally, I think the audience understands. And we, we're well used to seeing advertising on 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 television on on websites including non-profit uh websites that have started like the bbc in the uk certainly around the world you you, you will see advertising i think the audience understands that you need to make money and you need to pay for all this stuff there's an infrastructure that goes into producing these podcasts and uh, it's got to be paid for i agree i think that's kind of first era internet i think we need to evolve beyond that facebook's shown us that but we'll yeah. see yeah, I agree. I agree totally. And I think we will evolve beyond that point. I think we're all, we're still, I think, to some extent, finding our feet. And uh, as I say, I was really strong on wanting to find my sort of editorial feet with, with the podcast. I mean, maybe that was a mistake. Maybe I should have looked at the commercial marketing side at the beginning, but it's the way I've done it and uh, we'll move forward from it. So I want to transition a little bit now into technologies, especially ones that you're most excited about. What are you seeing? I know you're in LA. I know you spent some time in San Francisco. What are, what are the most interesting things you're hearing about or looking into or interested in today? Well, I suppose they're the technologies that I use a lot and they're mostly connected to communications, how easy it is for me to do my job uh, from a, a mobile phone. Most of the time I can broadcast in a way that, um, Maybe 10 years ago, I would have to have a, a satellite truck sitting outside with a huge satellite dish, uh, an expensive satellite booking, 
to, to do a broadcast. And now I can do all of that, uh, yes, on the mobile phone or just on a, on a Mac with a good broadband connection. And I can broadcast in what in the industry we call good quality. Uh, like you and I are talking right now, you can hear me pretty good quality. Um, and uh, the costs are extremely low. So that makes it possible to do things much faster from remote locations. You can get to the story faster. And uh, it's, it's more realistic for a one-man band, which a, a lot of us out at the coalface in the field are these days. We're one-man band reporters. And to be able to have all this technology at our fingertips that allows us to be on the air within seconds. I mean, I can be on BBC Radio within literally a couple of clicks of my mobile using software that connects with software in, in the UK. And that's what excites me about technology is just the way that I can do things way faster and uh, re maintain a certain autonomy. I'm not dependent on a, a lot of other people and a lot of expensive old style technology. Yeah, you've got more technology than it took to put a man on the moon in your pocket. It's quite something. Yeah, it is quite something. And we're, we're only still, I think, probably touching the surface as to what we can do with that tech in our pocket. But it, it's really, and of course, you know, the, the, the ability of uh, the, the cameras on mobile phones are so much better. We can do really top quality HD video that you can use on television. All of that kind of thing has really revolutionized the way that I do my job in the last uh, few years. Yeah, it's, uh, it's transforming the world, definitely. How old are you, Peter? I'm 56. 56. So mm. live long and master aging. What's the number? Is there a number? Oh, yeah. I, I, well, I want to get to at least 100. And I think from everything I understand, or maybe you don't even understand all of it, you know, 110 is not unrealistic. Um, I want to, but I do focus on health span as opposed to lifespan. And a lot of people don't get that distinction. I'm sure you do. But, um, you know, lifespan can not necessarily mean a particularly pleasant final 10 or 15 years of your, your life. You can still be alive and existing, but there isn't much of a life there. So I really focus on health span. I'm actually just in the middle of a three-part series talking to older athletes. And I say older, one in her 40s, and then a guy in his 60s, and a guy in his 70s, who are doing a lot of um, uh, events like Spartan races, and, and didn't, and certainly in terms of one of the two guys, didn't actually start till he was reasonably old and he'd had a lot of health problems as a younger man. Now he has basically transformed his health and he is looking to extend his health span into his 80s or, or 90s. He's just 68 years old now. Um, that's what I'm striving for. Um, but if you had to force me to give you a number, let's say 100, maybe 110. I still remember, it was, I think it was this last Olympics the the head and the head of and one of the com, uh, competitors i think it was romanian gymnastics team he was on his 6th olympics gymnastics is not easy i think if you put yourself through challenging circumstances you can come out the other side much younger than others oh yeah i um i've met a lot of people who uh, who've lived those kinds of lives and you know very challenging lives and and you're right gymnastics isn't easy i mean many other olympic sports you could say are, are equally difficult and, and people continue it seems for, for a long time and um they are better people for it and it probably goes back to what we were saying before about comfort zones that uh, you know you're going to get to a point in your life where some of these things start to be quite difficult i used to run marathons and i don't run marathons anymore because they became quite challenging on on the joints, and so I reverted to doing. Um, I was, became a triathlete, and uh, so I still run and I still swim and I, I, I bike as well. And um, it's a different kind of challenge. But even being a triathlete to some people in their fifties and sixties is way beyond their comfort zone. And the, and there've been times for me when it's been extremely difficult or doing a, a Spartan type race where you're climbing that mountain, you're jumping into freezing cold water. Um, you know, it, it's tough, but you you emerge from it much better. And I, I, I suspect those Olympians who reached a certain point in their career and were beginning to find it tough, but then persevered, as long as it's a sport that accommodates that. Not all sports accommodate, you know, 70 year old Olympians, but if it is a sport that you can keep on going. Um, you just got to get over that hurdle and you can reap the benefits, I think. And get over the concept of your personal best. It can't be your lifetime best. It has to be the best effort now. 
Yeah, I, mean, I don't dwell on necessarily the, the, the time that it takes me to get around uh, a course these days. I used to dwell on it a lot when I was a marathon runner and focus on you know the three hours and 46 minutes, I think was my best marathon time. And uh, But it didn't go sequentially. I didn't start slow and get faster and faster. I went up and down and had a badger and you know did a four hour plus marathon and then, then would come back and do a better one. You know, life is uh, you know, mixed with you know, there are lots of ups and downs and um you know that that's just part of life so i, I would say don't focus on on those numeric goals too much i mean it, it's good to watch the numbers and watch the figures but uh, don't focus on it too much I, i'm much more involved these days with just getting to the finishing line and feeling good at the end of it with friends who are feeling equally happy about finishing and that brings in the social side to this it isn't just a, a physical challenge when you get older taking part in these events it's a, a social occasion as well it's a perfect metaphor for life as well. Get to the end, happy, long race. You did your best and you got people there. Well, that really nicely sums up what health span is all about, isn't it? You, 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 I mean, the ideal life is that you have a great health span. You, you keep on living and doing whatever your thing is, whether it's dog training or, or gardening or uh, mountain climbing, you know, skiing, and you continue to do that for as many years as you can. And then ideally, I would say actually die quite quickly. Die of of old age, but not something that will keep you in a hospital bed for, for 10 or 15 years and, and where you have to be kept alive. And I think that's the kind of uh, longevity that, that most of us are looking for. And it's the kind that a lot of us are not having. Let's just think about the last five people you know that have died. How many of them died from old age and how many died from some type of disease? Probably chronic, probably neurodegenerative. It's, it's becoming rampant as we live longer and our diets become worse. Well, yes, and, and that's the great fallacy, I think, these days that people talk, uh, people kind of glibly say, oh, we're all living longer. Well, maybe to a point statistically, but actually not everywhere. And I think maximum lifespan is actually falling in, in, in some places. And you're absolutely right. People are dying of, of other things, whether it's chronic diseases, whether it's suicide, whether it's other things that strike us down earlier in life. Uh, and not many people are actually achieving that, that ultimate goal that that great health span because we're being in some cases kept alive despite the chronic disease that we have and we've got very good at, at doing that which i don't necessarily think is a is a great thing so there are so many challenges there too and i think the biggest challenge is to 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 try to tackle these chronic diseases try to you know, we need to tackle the cancers and the heart diseases diabetes and that's where you know, becoming full circle that's where i think fasting is is good I think the, the dilemma with fasting is which kind of fasting, there's a lot of confusion out there, which kind of fasting is best for us. Maybe there isn't an answer to that. Maybe we all respond in different ways to different kinds of fasting. So maybe a fasting mimicking periodic fast of a quick burst of five days every three or four months is, is good for some people. I think if you're in a reasonably good health and you have a good diet on the during the in-between times, that sort of check and balance approach of a fasting mimicking diet is, is good for you and good for your health span. For others, it might be a daily 16-8 routine. For others, it could be the 5-2 the diet where you have just two days out of the, the seven where you essentially have 700 calories and uh, you know, the other times you, you, you eat a, a normal but, but sensible diet. That's the real, and I don't, I don't know the answers to that. And I talk to a lot of scientists. I think the promote, answer is just doing something. It's like exercise. Yeah, I think it, I think just doing something uh, is is a great start, like like exercise. But then hopefully we can get to the time where we can finesse a little bit as to which kind of dietary re regime combined with our exercise regime is best for our individual bodies. I would say the the intermittent fasting is something that everyone needs to try because it's really not that hard to do. Oh, totally. Yeah, intermittent fasting. And again, uh, this will be a chapter in the book. Uh, you can hold me to this. Uh, intermittent fasting as a title, as a chapter heading, question mark, because there are so many different types of intermittent fasting. What do you mean by intermittent fasting? Is it going on a 5-2 diet? Is it going on, as some people do, a 23-1 a a diet of, of not eating for 23 hours and then just having one meal a day? Is it 16-8? Is it 12-12? All of these different types of fast, you've just got to look at the work of Sachin Panda, the Salk Institute. I interviewed him a few weeks ago. How different periods of, of fasting affect us in different ways. So it's if, if it's 12 hours, 13, 14, 15, 16 without food, it, it, it affects us all 
differently. The, the, the longer period you leave, and if you go to, let's say, 16, 8, um, the better it, it is for us in terms of exercise and be, just being able to keep on going. So our endurance is actually better the, the longer the period of, of fasting. Even, But having said that, even a 12-12 is still good for us. We can still reap rewards, but if we could just push it a little bit, our endurance, and he's shown this in, in experiments, especially with mice, that our endure, the endurance of, of mice certainly improves with the longer gap. So it comes back to what is the best kind of intermittent fasting, and maybe there should be different titles or different names for these different regimes, just to make it clearer to us you know, what we're talking about. I think for men, 16-8 is a good starting point. For women, probably 12-12. If you're trying to get pregnant, then it can be slightly different. None of this is, of course, legal, and none of this is medical advice. But I remember hearing a podcast, and I think it might have been Panda, actually. But they were doing uh, they were doing tests, and they were feeding rats. And they would feed the rats during the day, and then they tried flipping it, feeding the rats at night. And the ones at night got obese. The other ones were perfectly fine. And it yeah. it, it kind of points out the importance of timing with circadian rhythms circadian rhythms and timing is uh, and time restricted eating as he refers to it uh, and others as well is, is crucially important and uh, we all obviously have different lifestyles some of us can't avoid working at night or overnight we've got to have doctors and nurses and firefighters and people that are going to be available to us around the clock and and the challenge for those people working those shifts is how to best manage their circadian rhythm and there's a lot of really great research going on into that and and even if you are lucky enough like i am most of the time to, to work uh, generally during the day and i, I try to stop by 9 p.m as a, as a cutoff point and uh, and and i mean i mean completely stop and have a, a sort of relaxation time before going to sleep if you can maintain that every day and and nurture your circadian rhythm in that respect and 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 equally well i would say preferably stop your eating way before nine o'clock and then and then start at a regular time in the morning i think you can really really reap the benefits and uh, and your sleep improves as well your ancestors couldn't see what they were eating when it was dark out, so they probably weren't eating that much until we had fire. Yeah, yeah. We just got to look at you know those hunter-gatherer days, how we did things, because it was the only way we could do it, because we didn't have you know, lights in the ceiling to uh, you know to eat our food by, as you say. So you know, go back to a, a little bit more of a, a simpler way of of living, and it can actually guide us in the right direction. Get a blue light blocker for your laptop and phone as well. You guys will hate me when you turn it on initially, and then you'll never go back. Flux or something similar. It's uh, it's absolutely beautiful. Peter, I know, I know you're a busy guy and you got a lot going on. What is the one thing you would want to leave people with? A quote, a call to action, something like that. I would say, and we kind of touched on this, that um, in this frenetic world, I think I would leave people with the thought that you need to be a little bit selfish with yourself and, and to the benefit of yourself. And if we're talking about the whole body experience of just going through life and all the different experiences that we will encounter during the course of a day or a week, and some of those challenges can actually be quite difficult, dealing with other people, dealing with work commands and demands and, and children and commuting. We lead really stressful lives. I would say build into your day it can maybe only be 15 minutes, but ideally it's, go it's going to be an, an hour. And that might be the hour that you go for a walk with the dog, but just be a little bit selfish and just have that Zen moment. You, you might have to battle some days to create the time, but almost schedule it or schedule it at least to the point that it's kind of a movable feast. And if you don't achieve it in the morning, you know that you're gonna, you're gonna do something for yourself at, at 6 p.m. that evening. As I say, it can be 15 minutes, it can be an hour, whatever it is. It's something that's a little self-indulgent, and I think you will feel the benefits. And download some type of goal tracking app that triggers a notification right after you're supposed to be doing it so that you can track and monitor to see, am I actually doing a good job taking care of myself? I know for me, it's meditation. I try to do that daily, and it doesn't always happen, but it's super helpful. Yeah, I agree. I'm, I'm a I'm a big fan of, of apps that help us do those things. And you know, I'm 
fallible like anyone else and I can fall off the wagon and uh, I've been using Sachin Panda's uh, circadian rhythm app which is is really good but it takes a lot of effort and there's a lot of input of, of food and activities and sleep time I mean, and it's it's getting better but it really does help you keep on track if you try to maintain the, the upside of things and then you're realizing you're falling off the wagon because you're still eating it at eight o'clock at night or, or whatever it's 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 there for you to see so i'm i'm a big fan of 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 using apps but not necessarily overwhelming ourselves by the use of of apps and other technology i mean I, there was a point i was actually wandering around with three different trackers two on one wrist and one and the apple watch on this wrist um, i'm actually just down to one at the moment which is which is probably a good deal i think you can hack the 16 8 thing by basically saying okay i'm not going to eat until later and then I'll eat for six to eight hours and then I stop. It doesn't have to be perfect because as long as you're doing something, it's better than nothing. T totally agree. As long as you're doing something, it is absolutely better than nothing. And I think 16.8 is is pretty easy. And, and I suppose my, and I, I'm again, I'm not perfect on that and I'm, I'm working towards it every day. My little secret there is actually, and it suits me, it doesn't suit everyone, is actually to start eat, stop eating much earlier in the day. So I'm actually quite comfortable now with stopping eating maybe 4 p.m. in the afternoon is my is my final meal. And it can be quite a big meal. It can be a good, substantial meal. I, I've got over that sort of hump of the middle day. So I, I don't experience that slump after a large meal because I've got through most of my afternoon. But then I have my big meal and I can quite easily get through the evening and then start eating reasonably early, you know, 16 hours later. So we're looking at, what, 8 o'clock in the morning to start eating. I really enjoy eating in the morning and feel good eating in the morning. And there's some good science that suggests that we should eat in the morning. As I say, it doesn't suit everyone, but it, it suits me to, to, to just push that finishing time just a little bit earlier to what is, for most people, the middle of the afternoon. Yeah, I think it, I think it pays to pay attention to how you are and try to optimize that because no one else will and society is trying to pull you the exact opposite direction with food with advertising with pretty much everything we've talked about on on the show so far oh yeah yeah and you've got to be you've got to have a, a strong mind about this kind of thing you can't be easily led and there are there are distractions all over the place and that can be friends and, and family and, and advertising and there's food all over i was actually in my office uh, a couple of days ago, just with two other people who were eating constantly. There's a big bag of chips on the table, and it was just constant, constant, constant eating. And I actually didn't even mention anything. I was just kind of observing this and not eating myself. But it, it is the way a lot of people go through their lives, and, and it can't be good. It can't be good, that constant grazing. And so you do have to have a certain amount of discipline. And you know, there's a great sense of achievement coming through that if you can master that art of doing things your way when people around you are not. And, you know, people are actually more respectful than you would think if you have to turn down invitations because you don't want to do lunch on a particular day. Look, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, this is my diet regime. I don't do lunch. And they go, OK, that's fine. Um, I think it was Phil Libin who founded Evernote in San Francisco, had this great expression that he's really happy he's in San Francisco doing what he does, because he, he does fasts to an extreme. He, he can fast for five or seven days, and he's seen great results from it. But he says, look, doing it in San Francisco is great because everyone's doing something crazy all the time, so you're not the odd person out in San Francisco. Yeah, it's uh, it pays to be a little crazy because otherwise you're boring. Well, yeah, exactly. And, and crazy can be can be fun sometimes. Peter, this has been this has been a lot of fun. I know that you talk about a lot of these topics on your podcast frequently. Where's the best place for people to find you, learn more? Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. I've really enjoyed this. And uh, let's reverse roles. And I'll, I'll do an interview with you at some point for, for the podcast because I, I love talking about this stuff. But well, you can find me at um, the Live Long and Master Aging podcast. So that's uh, we use the acronym LAMA. So it's double L A M A. So it's LAMA podcast, double L A M A podcast dot com is the website that brings everything together. You can stream the podcast there. But then, of course, we're on most of the regular podcasting platforms, uh, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher. Uh, and others. Uh, you can find them all at the website. Uh, we're in social media at Llama Podcast, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And I can definitely endorse it, guys. It's a solid one. I've probably listened to probably 20-ish episodes. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. We're just just uh, so I'll not interview you, you now, but uh, of the episodes that you've listened to, and this is um, something I'm, I'm asking a lot of people, which 
do you prefer? What aspect of uh, the sort of longevity topics that I cover um, most excites and interests you? I think you're going to get two types of audience. You're going to get the more tech longevity focused ones, and then you're going to get the older, more optimizing my long-term health and well-being ones. So I'm more of the the former, but I, I imagine I imagine if you were to look at your demographics, it would probably be something like that. Yeah, thank you. And it is. And it, it seems to be a mix of that. And I did that deliberately because I didn't want to make it 100% tech. And I wanted to make it accessible to uh, as many people as possible, people who don't want to be too obsessed, as maybe you and I are with the tech side of things, and that uh, can be a little bit more relatable life stories. I think we can just learn from the life stories of, of some people who've um, maybe gone through life to, uh, and done things in their particular way without thinking about their longevity, but they've just happened to have fallen on the right way to do things, and they get to a great age, and I think we can learn a lot from that. Yeah, if you look at science, a lot of time they screw their way up into something incredible. They never saw it coming. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This has been fun. Thanks, Peter, and thanks, guys. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks to everyone for watching, and it's uh, really been a, a good conversation. Thank you. Yeah, check them out, guys. And again, disruptors.fm if you guys want to subscribe or get the show notes and all that good stuff. Cheers.